sinners who are spoken to by God and who tremble. We're actually going to find three different illustrations in the Bible of people who were spoken to directly by God and who were moved by God's word or by God's message or by God's reaching out to the point where they actually trembled. In Daniel chapter 5, we will begin at verse number 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princess, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princess, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. And they drank wine, praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. That's interesting, isn't it? And even when they were drinking and drunk, they were religious. Verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. Now, if we were to continue to read, we would find that he calls for people to interpret the writing. They can't find nobody until they bring in Daniel. Seems to be a recurring theme in the book of Daniel that he is able to reveal secrets or to interpret dreams, or in this case, God's writing. In verse number 20, we find that Daniel begins to speak of Belshazzar's grandfather. We're going to focus on that a little bit as we preach tonight, but in verse number 22, we read, And thou, his son Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest, all this. But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. And in verse 30, we read, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. New Testament, please, the book of Acts, chapter 24. The book of Acts, chapter 24. In verse number 24, and after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusia, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned, this is Paul now, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. And answer, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to shew the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Chapter 16 of Acts. Now we're in Acts chapter 16. And in Acts 16, we'll begin reading at verse number 25. We understand if we were to read earlier, we will find that Paul and Silas are in prison. Their feet are fast in the stocks. That means they are, uh, tie, are bound inside the prison. The doors are locked. In verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. 
and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for light, sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved in thy house. It, it would give the sense of that last phrase if we read it this way. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if all in thy house believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be saved also. But that's not my topic tonight and that's not my message. Three men who trembled, just like you. Three men who heard the voice of God, just like you. Three men and only one of them is in heaven tonight. You see, sometimes we lose the reality as we preach the gospel that while I'm standing here in, in the middle of a what is soon to be a potato field in a gospel hall in Rosebank, PEI, while Mr. Procopio is in his home, in his living room or kitchen, wherever, and while the believers in Newfoundland are there in Newfoundland and you are where you are, the men that we have read about tonight... They're all in eternity. That is, there came a moment in their experience where they breathed their last breath. And when they breathed their last breath and their heart beat for the last time, they closed their eyes for the final time in this world, and they opened up their eyes in eternity. Two of these men opened up their eyes to weeping wailing in a lost eternity. But one of these men closed his eyes for the last time in Philippi in the land of Macedonia over there in Europe. And he opened his eyes for the first time in the presence of the Lord Jesus. I don't know, my friends, if you have an imagination like I do, but I'm not sure what happened in his life after that after the night when he was saved. It could be that he lived a long, healthy life. It could be that he ended up bedridden with a sickness. It could be that he got, uh, had some dreaded terminal illness. It could be that he couldn't communicate with anyone from that point onward. But when he opened up his eyes in heaven and beheld the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think he remembers the voice of them preachers. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He's in heaven tonight. Two, three men spoken to by God, just like you. Three men who trembled, just like you. Three men who are in eternity. Very soon to be just like you. We cut into Daniel chapter 5 in the life of Belshazzar. Belshazzar was a king. He was a king. He was not the only king in Babylon at that time. If you were to watch it closely, from the time of, Neb of Nebuchadnezzar the king, it got handed down to uh, sometimes his sons-in-laws, sometimes his grandsons-in-laws, but it ended up going to a descendant of his who was first king, if you want to call it that. But he was a very religious man, and he worshipped a god that the Babylonians did not prefer. So he moved out of Babylon, and he left his son Belshazzar to reign. Belshazzar was also a religious man, but he was a religious man who loved pleasure. A religious man who would worship the gods of silver and brass and gold and stone and wood, but a religious man who found time, almost all the time, to drink and party and have fun. 
I'm going to make a full stop here because I believe there are some people who are listening to us tonight, and that is very descriptive of your outlook. You only live once, right? So you might as well enjoy life while you can. Enjoy life with all its pleasure. Enjoy life with all its sin. Enjoy life with all its drinking. Enjoy life with all of the adultery and the sexual immorality. Enjoy life just like Belshazzar was enjoying life. But there's something very telling about the experience of Belshazzar that I want to draw your attention to. That is this. His grandfather or great-grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, was a proud man. He was a proud man and he was a sinful man. In fact, he was a man who put God, the true God, out of the picture as often as he could. And he comes out and he looks at his own kingdom one day and he looks around and he says, I am the man who has built all of this. Is not this Babylon great Babylon that I have built? And according to this very same book, the book of Daniel, the Lord took him from being on the throne and he made him crawl on his knees as a beast in the field. And without getting into too much of the story of Nebuchadnezzar, we find out that at the end of it, he's converted. At the end of his dealings with God, he realizes the most high reigns. He realizes that he is not in control. God is in control. And there's a point in the experience of the life of Nebuchadnezzar that he puts his faith in God. Not only was there a point when he did that, but when he comes back to the throne, he writes a letter so that everybody in the kingdom will know. Will know what? I was once a lost sinner, proud in my sins, until God humbled me, and now I'm converted. I have faith in the God of heaven. Would have changed his life forever. You know it as well as I know it. When he wrote that letter, everyone in the kingdom would have been scratching their head, but they couldn't argue with the facts. He was like this, and now he's like this. And Belshazzar would have been just a young boy, perhaps, when all that was going on. He had a saved grandfather. Let's put it that way. A saved grandfather who made an effort to share the message of salvation with everyone. So, here it is. As he is living the life of sinful pleasure, Daniel points out, you knew all of this. You knew all of the dealings of God with your grandfather. You saw the changed life that was evidenced after his conversion. You saw the reality. You heard the message of what had happened. You knew right from wrong. If I was to tell it to you tonight, I could say you knew the gospel. Not only did you know the gospel, but you knew there's reality in this gospel. You knew by the lives of other people, not that they're perfect. You'll understand, of course, that Mr. Procopio and I have not once preached the perfection of the Christians as your way of salvation. There are no perfect Christians. But let's be blunt. A person who is saved is different than they used to be. It's evidence of the power of God in their life. And as Daniel was in the presence of Belshazzar, he was telling him, you knew better. When you were drinking like that, you knew it was wrong. When you were committing those sins, you knew it was wrong. When you were involved in adultery, you knew it was wrong. When you were involved in idolatry, you knew it was wrong. When you were having this party, you knew it was wrong. When you took that next drink, you knew it was wrong. And still you're trying to put it out of your mind every time so you can move forward in your sin. Sound familiar? I know it does, because that was me. My dad might be listening to this tonight, but he wouldn't mind me telling you. There was a time when I tried my hand at entertaining. So I learned how to play a guitar uh, minimally, if that's a word that applies. Uh, I... 
uh, considered myself to be uh, somewhat of a singer, uh, minimally. And I would gather together with people and I would sing songs. I would sing songs at house parties. I would sing songs sometimes with bands that we had formed uh, at street parties and in Legion halls and all of those things. And it just so happened that my dad back in the 70s was also an entertainer. He was a musician, a drummer. There was one time my dad came to me and he said, you know, when you're up on that stage, looking at all those people, drinking and smoking and laughing and having a good time, you remember, they don't know what you know when it comes to the gospel. And he was right. But that hasn't stopped you yet, has it? We might only get to talk about Belshazzar tonight and leave the other two for another time. But you're like Belshazzar, aren't you? You know better. And still you keep going. That's heavy. Because of what happens next. While he was having this huge party, what would happen is he would have people come to his uh, party from all over the kingdom. Most of them would have been rulers in other parts of the kingdom. The kingdom of Babylon was huge. Up until that point, there had not been a kingdom that size. I believe what will overtake the kingdom of Babylon in size will be Alexander the Great as he conquers across toward the east. But he had a lot of people here. A lot of people... A lot of wine, a lot of drinking, a lot of fun, a lot of sin. And it's right in the middle of this party when something happens that changes his countenance. Now, when the Bible says it changes his countenance, it really means it changed the look on his face, changed the way he, he was standing. It changed his countenance. What was it that changed his countenance? We know that in partying and drinking and laughing and carrying on, he would have been smiling. He would have been giggling. He would have been bubbly. And he goes from a man who is smiling and giggling and bubbly to a man who's actually stone-faced, flushed, and trembling. What made the difference? God spoke to him. The fingers of a man's hand, we are told, came and they wrote a message on the wall. If I were to be able to get to my other two passages tonight, I would tell you this. In the event of Felix, Felix was spoken to by God, but he was spoken to by God in a gospel meeting as the gospel preacher began to tell him about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled in a gospel meeting. The man in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, he was spoken to by God, but not in a gospel meeting now. He was spoken to by God through the circumstances of life. When the earthquake came, it changed his life. When the earthquake came, it changed his outlook. It changed his focus. It changed his priorities. And in changing his focus and priorities, he began to think not about the here and now, but about eternity and where he will be after he dies and what must he do to be saved. And you see, God does speak in gospel meetings, just like this one. Why? He's trying to get your attention. He's not trying to get your attention so he can scare you. He's trying to get your attention so he can save you. So that you'll stop on that broad road that's behind me. So that you'll stop and turn and come to Christ. That's why God speaks in a gospel meeting. And for some, it's the circumstances of life. And you'd never get them to hear the gospel. And you'd never get them to come to a meeting. And they might even laugh. If you were to share with them the gospel message until the earth comes. Until something happens in their life that gets them to stop. 
Oftentimes, it's the death of a loved one. Other times, it's a pandemic like this that comes into the land. First I've ever seen of this, by the way. But it's getting people to stop and think. Sometimes it's an illness that comes in and touches your life. And God allows it. So that you'll stop. I am thankful. I didn't mean to get that far ahead of myself. I am thankful that the man who experienced the earthquake is in heaven tonight. Perhaps I'm speaking to someone tonight and you've had an earthquake in your life and it's not pleasant, not saying it is, but God allowed it so that you'll stop. Turn. Trust Christ. That's the grace of God. But now we have Belshazzar, and he's spoken to by God as well, but he's spoken to by God by actual words that are written by God on the wall. It's a picture for us of God speaking through the Bible, isn't it? Where the word of God is used and taken as the authority on spiritual things, but also living. The word of God is active. The word of God is discerning. The word of God has power. And God uses his word to speak to people. And when God spoke to Belshazzar through his word, he stopped. He trembled. His face changed. But now he wants to know, what is it? that God is saying. What is it that God is saying to me? He calls for all the astrologers, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans. And not a man could help them. Why? They didn't know the Lord. How are they going to tell this man what God is trying to say to him if they didn't know the Lord himself or themselves? But they bring in Daniel. And Daniel comes in, and he has a little preach. I understand that. But he's going to tell this man what the words are. I want everyone who has their set or their, their computer or their phone tuned in to pay very close attention over the next five minutes. Give me your complete undivided attention. Stop looking over your shoulder. Stop answering the little buzzes on your phone. You owe it to yourself to pay attention. Daniel begins to tell this man the message from God. It's a message of judgment. Meeny, meeny, tikel, you farson. Meeny. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. What does this mean? It means it's all over. The end. There is no tomorrow. You're going out tonight. The message of God for you is about the end. And you can almost see the wheels turning as he thinks. And then you can almost see the wheels turning as he begins to smile and say, let's make Daniel the third ruler in the kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom's gone. It's over. He now refuses to face the reality of the end. And he goes back to drinking. And he goes back to partying. 
History tells us that what, what had happened on that night, as the Medes and the Persians were now going to come in, or, or the Medes anyway, Darius the Mede is going to be the man who is going to reign in Babylon for the Persian Empire. How did he enter the city? He entered the city by going underneath the city's, uh, I want to call it the, the reservoir, but it's not. It's where the river would have flown through the city. They diverted the river. All the while, the king was drunk. It was his responsibility to take care of all this stuff. And he allowed all this to happen, and they came in under the gates, and they overtook the city, and the kingdom was no longer there. The kingdom was no longer his. But God told him in his word, this is how it's going to end. It's going to end tonight. And here's the key. A man who is spoken to by God, and it bothered him so much that he trembled goes back to drinking and partying and pleasure. And he lost his soul. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Just that short little statement. as a man opens up his eyes in hell. He knew better. I'm going to leave you with the words of Daniel as he is preaching to this man. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, in whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. going to read about another man. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the little one-page book of Philemon. That's after all the T's in the New Testament. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, right before the book of Hebrews. Somebody just did something to my screen. Book of Philemon, there's only one chapter. We'll read it the first verse. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou, therefore, receive him. That is, mine own bowels or my own heart. Verse number 17. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I trust that God will bless. What you've heard at the opening of this meeting, along with this short account of a runaway sinner. I'll just tell you what the letter is about because you need to read the whole letter to get it, and you probably need to read it several times before you understand it. But Onesimus was a runaway slave. He ran away from Philemon, and he ended up in the city of Rome, and he ended up in the same prison that Paul was in, the preacher of the gospel. And through his contact with the preacher of the gospel, the man was saved. And on the reconnaissance of, of Paul, the man is set free with this caveat that he must go back to his master. And Paul sends him back to his master, and he writes this letter 
that we've read four or five verses of. He writes this letter because Paul knows the master. And because Paul knew the master and the master had gotten saved in meetings Paul had had earlier, now he sees the master's runaway slave saved and he sends him back. But he sends him back with this letter, a letter saying that he would pay for all the wrongs that Onesimus has done. Where did Paul get that? You see, Paul realized what Onesimus did is exactly what all of us have done. And what Paul was doing was what the Lord Jesus did for Paul. He paid his debt so he could be set free. So I just want to look at three or four statements from this account tonight. They're very simple statements, and you'll see the relevance to you, I hope, tonight. First of all, there's this little expression that Paul says, if he hath wronged thee. Got it? If he hath wronged thee. Now, Paul knew right well there was no if to it. He's being kind, but he knew right well the man had wronged his master. So I want to speak to you about that, the wrongs that we have done. There's no if about it. The wrongs that we have done. Because you and I are verily guilty. We have sinned with a high hand against God. That's why these gospel meetings are continuing. Because the need is there. We are sinners before God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no if. There's no ands. There's no buts. We have all sinned. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. All of us, there is no difference, for all have sinned. Paul writes to this man, the master, about the wrongs that Onesimus did. Actually, Onesimus robbed him. He's a slave. He had nothing of his own, so he robbed his master and left. You say, what a wicked thing. Have you ever robbed God? Forget about Onesimus now. What about you? Ever rob God? You breathe his air? You, you, you speak language? You enjoy life? All the things that God has given you, and you take those very things, and you use them against God. You curse God's name. You turn your own way. You do everything your own way, and you have no God in your life. The fool has said in his heart, no God for me. That's you. That's me. That's the way we lived in our sins. And if you're not saved tonight, that's the way you still live. Shall a man rob God? The prophet asked. Yes, men rob God every day. They rob the master. There is one that we will answer to. And yet, we live as if we'll never give an account. We live as if we're not responsible. And yet, every single one of us are responsible before God. And every single day, we rob God. You have robbed God. You have robbed others. You have taken your own way. He's a man that was guilty of robbing his master. Oh, my friend, if there's no other charge that God ever brings against you, that is enough that you have robbed God. You've robbed him of your time. You've robbed him of the good things that he's given you. You've robbed them of the health that he's given you. You've taken everything that God has given and you've used it on selfish ends to selfish means for yourself. And you've given no glory to God. A man has robbed God. Onesimus robbed his master, but he ran. He ran from his master. I have no doubt Philemon was a good master because there was a time when this man got saved. Philemon actually trusted Christ. And as you were just hearing from Brother Brody, that changes a man's life. And no matter what he was like before he was saved, since the man was saved, he treated others 
kindly. He treated others as a Christian should. Paul says that in his letter to him. I know you. I know how you treat people. I know what you will do for people. So he's a good man. And yet, this man runs away from him. I wonder, was he running from the gospel? Because the gospel came right into that home. And yet this boy runs away from it. I know I'm speaking to some people that are on the run. I know that. You've run away from home. You left your father's house. Is it because of the gospel? Too restrictive? The gospel that you've rejected? And you turn and run from it? Some of you have run all the way from Newfoundland to Alberta. That's a long way. Oh, you say, yes, it's for work. It, yeah, it's for work, all right. You're telling me there's no work between Alberta and Newfoundland? What about the 12 million people that live in between? None of them working? No, no, to get as far away as you can. Some of you have gone further. Perhaps there's some of you listening tonight and you're in BC. As far as you can get in Canada, from one coast to the other, far from home, far from the gospel. And yet tonight, this afternoon for you, find you listening to a gospel meeting. I trust you are. You can run, my friend, but you can't hide. You can run, but God will follow you. For it seems that here's a boy on the run, and God followed him all the way to the prison and brought him right to the next cell where there's a preacher of the gospel. Praise God. God can do that. And God will do that to you. I'll tell you a little story. It just comes to mind. I had a neighbor one time in uh, New Harbor, Newfoundland. His name was John. His wife wouldn't mind me telling you this. John was not saved. Came out to a few gospel meetings, but John had a, had a heart disease. This is years ago when they were just starting to do heart and lung transplants. The end of John's episode was this. He needed a heart and lung transplant. And they were going to ship him from St. John's, Newfoundland to London, Ontario. I went in to see him the day he was to be airlifted out of St. John's. The whole family was in the room, and I couldn't get a chance to talk to him. I was kind of frustrated, so I walked out of the room, and I was kind of pacing in the hallway. And a doctor came up to me, and he says, something wrong, son. I said, yes, there's something wrong. I said, the man in that room is dying. I said, and I'm a gospel preacher, and I only have a few minutes to speak to him about his soul. And I said, there's about 15 people in that room, and I can't get a chance to get close enough to speak to him. To my amazement, the doctor said, leave that to me. I don't know who the doctor was. He walked in the room. He said, hey, what's going on in here? Everybody out. This man is a very sick man. You've had long enough in here. Everybody leave. Say your goodbyes. You leave. After they all left, the doctor came. He says, you got five minutes. I went in and shut the door. I said, John, I'm here to talk to you about your soul. I said, you're going for surgery that may not be successful, and you're not ready to die. Whatever you do, don't go for that surgery before you know Christ. He looked up at me. He says, how can I be saved, John? How can I be saved? I spent the next five minutes reading and praying with that boy, seeking to point him to Christ, but he didn't get saved. They flew him out that evening, gets in London. They bring him up to his room, and I called a friend in London to see if he would go visit my friend in the hospital. And he said, sure, I'll go see him. When he got up to the room to see my friend, John, he looked in the next bed, and the man in the next bed said, oh, Merv, how'd you know I was here? You come to see me? Here in the very next bed was a gospel preacher.
He said, no, I didn't come to see you. I came to see this boy. He says, John Procopio called me and asked me to come to see this boy who's dying. He said, I came to talk to him about his soul. Well, he said, no problem there. He says, I've been preaching to him all afternoon. Lands in the very next bed with a gospel preacher on a ward, on the heart ward. Now, here's the, here's the strange thing. That gospel preacher didn't even have heart problems. They misdiagnosed him for one day. Just for one day. He's put on the heart ward. It was actually his gallbladder. And that night they moved them off that ward, but not before this happened. The doctor came in for my friend to sign some papers for a test. And he told him, you gotta sign these because this test can be fatal. And John looked up at the doctor and he said, Doc, I I'm not ready. The doctor said, you got a half an hour to get ready. I'll be right back. He looked over to the gospel preacher which was Dave Kember, and he says, Mr. Kember, can you tell me how to be saved in a half an hour? Mr. Kember said to him, John, if I were you, I'd take that IV pole off the corner of that bed, and I'd go in that washroom, and I'd get on my knees, and I'd cry to God to save me if I were you. John took that pole off the bed, went into the washroom, shut the door, got on his knees by the toilet, got on his knees in that hospital and cried to God to save him. And he said, right there, I found peace. I understood that's why Christ died, to save a sinner like me. God can arrange circumstances. God arranged the circumstances in this man's life so that that man could be saved. And Onesimus finds himself right next to a gospel preacher who pours into his ears the truth of the gospel, how that Christ died for the ungodly. Though he could run, he can't get away from God. And though you may run, my friend, you'll never outrun God. He'll follow you to the ends of the earth because he desires to save you. And he tells this boy, you must return. You must return. You're going home. You know, the Lord Jesus said, except you return, excuse me, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's what repentance is, you know. It's returning. It's turning around. It's stopping. It's stopped the running. It's stopped the hiding. It's stopped the excuses. It's returning. And for this boy, he had to make an about face and go back and face the music, go back and face his sin. And for you, it's the same thing, my friend. If ever you're going to be saved, you're going to have to stop running. You're gonna to have to turn from your sin and turn not just toward home, turn to Christ with all your heart, turn to the Lord Jesus. And I'll tell you what you'll find. You'll find a savior with arms outstretched to receive you. He longs for you to return the wrongs that we have done. But he says this, or if he oweth thee aught, that's old English, for the debt of sin that we owe. If he oweth thee anything, you and I have, have amassed a great debt of sin. The Lord Jesus said that to Simon, the Pharisee, when he said to him, I'm going to tell you a story about a creditor and two debtors. All he was trying to illustrate for the man was, in life, we are debtors. In life, we amass a great debt of sin. You and I owe a great debt, a debt of sin that we could never pay. You know, Job, the oldest book in the Bible, Job, you heard about the troubles of Job. Well, Job was a good man, you know. Listen to what Job said when it came to his debt. Job realized in Job chapter 16, my record is on high. There's a record being kept of my life, and it's on high. It's kept by God. 
God keeps the ledger, my friend. And every single day in your sins, you're adding to that record. And the record is growing and growing and growing until the Lord Jesus said, as he talked to Simon, there were two debtors and it came to the point where they couldn't pay. One's debt was so large, he couldn't pay. And the other one whose debt wasn't quite as large found out he couldn't pay. There was a great debtor. There was a small debtor, but they had this in common. They had nothing to pay. Oh, yes, my friend, your record is on high. The Apostle Paul repeats that in Romans chapter 14. He says, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone shall give an account of himself. We play the blame game here on earth. We point fingers to each other and say it's his fault, his fault. He made me. He did. No, no, no. God says himself. Account of himself to God. But it gets even finer than that, my friend. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account in the day of judgment. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account in that day of judgment. Oh, my friend, the debt is on high, the record is on high, the ledger is kept, and you must answer to it because the record is kept. And God requires recompense. That's why Paul says, if he oweth the ought, if payment needs to be made, Paul knew there was a payment that needed to be made. Again, no if about it. He's being kind. He's going to ask Philemon if he can pay the debt, but he knows there's a debt to be paid. Oh, my friend, there's a debt you must pay. God will not sweep our sin under the car carpet. God will not let us away even with the sins of our youth. Every sin must be recompensed. There must be the just recompense and reward for all that we have done. Can you pay? You can't. But it must be paid. What's a runaway slave going to pay? He's got nothing. He's bankrupt. What's a runaway sinner going to pay? You have nothing to pay God. The very best you can do is an insult in the face of God. Nothing to pay, yet payment must be made. Oh, but my friend, there is one thing you can do. Repentance is commanded. If recompense must be made, God requires one thing, repentance. That's your part. What must I do to be saved? Repent, my friend. Turn from your sin. You know, Paul preached that. Acts chapter 17, when he comes into Athens and he sees this, this, this alt altar to an unknown God, ignorantly, they put up this altar. And you know what Paul says? Listen, that unknown God? The times of this ignorance is past, Paul says. God now commands all men everywhere to repent. That's what God commands of you, to turn from your sin and to turn to Christ. Repentance is commanded. It's commanded by God. Why? Because you owe a great debt that you cannot pay. Remember the boy? the prodigal son in the far country, there's another boy that ran away. And if you're running tonight, listen to what this boy did. He came to his senses. The scripture says he came to himself. Yes, for the first time he's in his right mind. And he begins to think, there's only one thing left for me to do. That's to turn around, to turn back to the father, to repent of my sin. And he makes up his mind in the far country, I will say to my father, I have sinned. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Is there a son I'm talking to tonight? Is there a son listening to these meetings? 
You've been listening to the preaching of the gospel. You're not worthy to be a son. Face it. You've sinned against God. It's time to turn. And it's time to repent. Acknowledge before God. I have sinned. Oh, but you know that boy in that far country? <laughs> yes, it's easy when you're all alone sitting with the pigs to say, I have sinned. To say, I will return. Great intentions, right? Far away, all alone, feeling the guilt. You know what I love about that story? The very next verse says, and he did it. And he arose and came to his father and said to his father, exactly what he made up his mind to do, he up and did it. You know, it's time for some of you young ladies to up and do it. It's time for some of you young men to up and do it. You know what needs to be done. You know repentance is required. You sit and listen to the gospel. Maybe you don't even want to listen to it, but something has made you turn it on, and you're listening tonight. It's time to put it into practice. What you know should be done, do it. This boy arose and came. Here's this boy in Esmus that we're talking about. And Paul says, I'm sending him back. He's coming back. And he arose and he went. But then he says something very strange. He said, if he oweth thee aught, put that on my account. Wait, 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 wait. Put that on my account. What is Paul mad? Put that on my account. No, my friend, that's the great news of the gospel. That's what we've been trying to tell you every night. That's what's going on in these meetings. We want to tell you that there was one man that had a good account with the master. Just one. But that's all that was necessary. One man in good standing with the master. One man that had a count that was big enough. One man that had a good account. Oh, can I tell you again tonight about one man that has a good account with the Father? That's the Lord Jesus, God's beloved Son. That's why the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He has a good account. He has a large account. And he says, I'll take that debt that they owe, put it on my account. That's an amazing thing, friend. I don't know anybody that'll do that for you other than the Lord Jesus. And in this case, Paul is a picture of the Lord Jesus. He's a, he has learned from the Lord Jesus because Paul was a great sinner. And Paul found out on the Damascus road that there was one with a good account with the master and all his sins were laid on Christ and put on that account. But he said, I will pay it. And the debt of sin he owed was put on the account of another. Can I tell you tonight that the great debt of your sin and mine was put on the account of the Lord Jesus? Oh, I'm thankful that there was one with a good account. But even more than that, friend, not only one with a good account, but one with a willing heart. There was only one with a willing heart to open up his account to take in all the debt of sin I owed. There's only one with a good account and a willing heart to take in your debt of sin. We're preaching a savior who loves you, who has a willing heart to take in all that are weary, all that are sick in their sins, all that have a debt of sin. He'll take the whole account. He says, charge that to me. Amazing love. How can it be? That thou, my God, should die for me. Yes, my friend. He had a willing heart. But it took more than a good account. And it took more than a willing heart. You see, there might be others with a willing heart. But they don't have the power to pay. Here's a man with the power to pay. You say, well, did, did Paul really pay for Onesimus' crime? Absolutely. 
I believe it. There were other slaves in that household. A right gospel testimony must be maintained. Paul's word is good. If he owes thee, put that on my account, I will pay it. And he paid the debt he owed. He paid it in full. Can I tell you, my friend, that there was not only one with a good account to the master, not only one with a willing heart to take your debt of sin, but there was one who had the power to pay. And pay he did. Did he really pay? Yes, he really paid it. He paid it in drops of rich ruby blood on Calvary's cross. He paid it with the nails through his hands and his feet. He paid it with a crown of thorns upon his head. He paid it with the cruel lash of the Roman whip. But oh, my friend, he paid it far more than that. He paid it with the sword of Jehovah. He paid it with the awful wrath of God when God the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He paid it with the chastisement of our peace when it was laid upon him. All oh, the punishment, the punishment, the payment that Christ paid, and only he could pay it. The hymn writer, poet has said this, there was none other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate to heaven and let us in. He only had the power to save. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus said, has power on earth to forgive sins. I'm thankful that there was one man with the power to pay. And I'll tell you why. Because he paid for this sinner's sins. He did. He paid for all my sins. Did I deserve such a payment? Absolutely not. To this day, I bow my head in shame when I think of my sin. To this day, I bow my head in amazement that I'm saved, that someone else would pay the price of my sin. And I thank God, I thank them three times already today that Christ paid the debt for my sin. The good news tonight is he paid it for you too. Oh yeah. Even though you're still in rejection and rebellion and running, he paid it for you. That's what we're preaching tonight. Christ paid the debt. Oh, you say, how would I know that? How could I know that? Would you like to know that? Here's Onesimus. And Paul gives him, Paul gives him a note. A little scroll. He rolls it up. And he says, give this, give this to Philemon. Because I wrote something on there. And I can see Onesimus said, really? What'd you write? Go ahead, he said. You're free to read it. He opens up the scroll. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay. Woo, he said. I got it. It's right here. I got it in his word. He's written it with his own hand. I pay the price. Oh, my friend, can you not see? That's what this book is all about. God has written it with his own hand. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that ye may know. Oh, I can see Onesimus as he starts that long journey back from Rome to Asia. And every once in a while, he pulls the scroll out of his pocket. Let's see. What does it say? I, Paul, have written it. I paid the price. And he rolls it back up. And he goes another day. And he thinks, oh, I don't deserve this. Uh, oh, let me see. Did he write it? Yes, he wrote it. It's right here. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. Oh, my friend, how can you know? You can know because God has written it right here. Pull it out and read it again. Read it for yourself. The assurance of the written word. There is nothing like it. Live by it. Love it. That's what God has given to us. How can I know? That's the first question. Read it and you'll say, when will I know? When will you know? The moment you read it. I can just see. He's going down the road and doubts begin to fill his mind. He pulls it out from his pocket. I don't know. He said, I don't know. 
Oh, yes, there it is. There it is. Now I know. A little while later, reads it again. Yes, there it is. Now I know. How does a person know? When does a person know they have eternal life? The moment God says it. Will God say it to you tonight? Oh, yes, he will. If you would just tune in and read it. That's how a person knows they have eternal life. That's how a person knows they're saved. They get the assurance of what Christ did 2,000 years ago. They get the assurance tonight from the written word of God. May God give that to you tonight from his own word. I will repay. I have written it with my own hand. Let's pray. Father, we ask thy blessing.